All right, welcome back, everyone. So, uh, like I said, I am obviously not able to be in class, but thank you for putting up with me uh, just putting out a, a quick lecture video. Uh, so, in this video, I'm going to talk about the rise of algorithmic trading and high-frequency traders. So I'll start off talking about the benefits of speed, uh, which I think we can all appreciate. Next, I'll introduce you to algorithmic trading, and then finally, I'll wrap up with a series of very popular high-frequency trading strategies that have become almost commonplace in, in the market. So let's get started. All right, so the first thing that I wanted to do was talk about a piece of financial technology that was finished back in 2008. So back in 2008, it made the news that this organization called Spread Networks had dug a fiber optic cable from Chicago to New Jersey and New York. They dug this cable from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange all the way to the NASDAQ data center in New Jersey. Uh, so they, the goal here was to create this trench and fill this trench with the cable and make this about as straight a line as possible. So the actual cable from Chicago to New Jersey was something, I think it was about 825 miles, as the crow flies, as they say. And this, this cable, or the, the length of this cable, was significantly shorter than the length of existing cables. And there's a benefit to doing this. Essentially, if one trader found out some information while they were on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and they wanted to profit from that information by sending an order to the NASDAQ, they now have a faster route between Chicago and the NASDAQ, which means that their order gets there first. This concept of speed is captured in this, this term we often dub latency. It's the time delay between an order being placed and the execution of the order. So in this case, it would be the time between when you click the mouse button to request the trade and the time when the trade is filled, or rather reaches the, the NASDAQ server. So that, that latency, the longer that is, the less likely you are to get your order filled at the price you want. And in the case of spread networks, the benefit here was being first. So the benefit of this, this fiber optic cable that essentially was built in a straight line from New York to Chicago was that it reduced the, the latency time by about three milliseconds or three thousandths of a second. And so if you're trying to send a message or send an order from one place to the other, your order gets there faster and it's more likely to be filled faster. So this is why when Spread Networks built this line, they started charging millions of dollars for access to the line. Now, the reason I start off with that example and the, you know, the benefit of being fast is because it's one of the most famous cases of increases in technology affecting trading behavior. That example itself was mentioned in a book called Flash Boys by Michael Lewis, which was written a couple of years ago. And in that book, Michael Lewis describes several other techniques used by high-frequency traders. Another technique they used was something called flash trading. And in flash trading, what investors or high-frequency traders would do is they would, on one exchange, wait for these orders called flash orders to come in. And then those flash orders, they show the, the order for a fraction of a second, and then a high-frequency trader would see that order and then go out and place another order that allowed them to jump in line and then receive those shares and then sell those shares for a slight profit to whoever had placed any additional orders for that, those shares. Flash trading is often seen as a form of front running, which is, I think, a lot of investors, a lot of uh, analysts would say certainly unethical, but uh, it, it has happened a lot in the past. One of the people that saw this as unethical was a man by the name of Brad Katsuyama, who was, he was a, I think he was the head of the trading desk at the Royal Bank of Canada. And he's actually one of the protagonists in this book, Flash Boys. And this series of events where he recognized 
the existence of spread networks cable and the existence of flash trading allowing high-frequency traders to beat his orders to market is one of the reasons why he started the Investors Exchange, or IEX. And IEX, as you hopefully know from the last video that I put out, is one of the 13 exchanges that exists in the U.S. The other 12 are exchanges run by the NASDAQ, the New York Stock Exchange, and the Chicago Board Options Exchange, or the SIBO. IEX is a little different. See, Katsuyama's idea was that this exchange would essentially level the playing field. Uh, IEX, it has several advances, the most famous of which is what's dubbed the speed bump. And the speed bump, it allows the exchange to essentially slow down all orders that come into its matching engine, the engine that actually matches up buy and sell orders. So the speed bump, it's literally as simple as 38 miles of fiber optic cable, which is actually kind of ingenious. If you want to see a video on that, feel free to click the uh, link that I have right here. But the speed bump, its goal is to slow down every order so that by the time that order reaches the matching engine, there's no way that a high-frequency trader can receive that order information and then use that information to go out to another exchange and trade on that information. So the speed bump, it slows down all transactions by, or all uh, information by about 350 microseconds or millionths of a second. Okay, so let's take a look at how that front running works. So let's say you have an investor and that investor is in New Jersey. Uh, so here I have uh, New Jersey and then over here I have uh, Manhattan, so lower Manhattan. So investor one places orders for 200 shares for, of Ford for $15 a share on two exchanges. Uh, so they submit a buy order on exchange A and they send an order to exchange B for the same thing. Well, their order at this location, this geographic location in Manhattan is just across the water uh, from where the, the investor is uh, located. So in terms of geographic distance, it's a lot shorter. So this order might take 10 microseconds to come in, whereas this second order, it's going to take some time to get to uh, lower Manhattan, where Exchange B is. So this order, it might take 25 microseconds to come in. And in that time, something can happen. So once this order makes it to Exchange A, there might be a high-frequency trader there that's co-located, meaning they have a server in literally the same building as Exchange A. So this high-frequency trader sees this order and then sends an order directly to Exchange B to buy 100 shares at $15 a share, and this order, it takes 10 microseconds to go. So you've got this 10 microseconds, 10 microseconds, and we'll assume there's obviously some computing time, so, you know, uh, it, it'd be a little more than 20 microseconds. But the, the key here is that this high-frequency trader can submit an order to buy shares of Ford before Investor 1, uh, or Investor 1's order gets to Exchange B. So the high-frequency trader buys up these shares at $15 a share, and then when Investor 1's order comes in, well, now there's no other shares there to be bought for $15 a share. Investor 1 has to buy those shares for $16, and it could be the case that the high-frequency trader is willing to sell those shares at $16. So the high-frequency trader receives a dollar profit on each of these shares that it bought and then very quickly sold. And so this is one of the main ways that high-frequency traders profit. They essentially are using a form of exchange arbitrage, or there's various other ways to refer to it, but exchange arbitrage is uh, a pretty common way. So how prominent and how quick are high-frequency traders? Well, it'll depend on the exchange and the asset class being traded, but uh, high-frequency traders make up about 50 to 60% of U.S. trading volume. In equities, in Forex, it might be a touch larger. Uh, in terms of the speed, uh, nowadays the latency of 
high frequency traders is actually extremely low. It's about five to 10 microseconds. And notably in the last couple of years, there's been this consolidation of high frequency traders. In fact, uh, nowadays, only about six trading firms win about 80% of these, these high frequency trades or trading wars, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, the, the academic piece that I am sourcing this from is this one right here. If you want to actually read the entire paper, it's a very interesting read. Uh, another big takeaway from this is that about a third of the price impact from new information is being captured by high frequency traders. And that results in about $5 billion per year. Uh, so high frequency traders, they're capturing a large amount of value. And uh, it's, I mean, it's really being captured by about six firms. Now, ever since the, uh, that spread networks uh, cable example that I gave you, there's been a lot of changes in technology. One of the most important uh, advances was the development of air transmission of uh, trade orders. So back in 2012, several different firms built uh, towers to essentially send their orders from one location to another. So for example, the uh, McKay brothers, uh, they built a series of towers to send their orders from Chicago to New York in 2012. So about four years after the story that started this particular video. Uh, so those orders were able to be processed in about 8.5 milliseconds versus the 13.3 milliseconds quoted by spread networks. So these orders are coming in faster, which means that the high frequency traders that use this network could get their orders placed faster and front run the other uh, you know, high frequency traders. So you have this arms race that's been developed, developing over the years. Uh, nowadays though, we are starting to see some, some uh, diminishing returns to scale uh, because quite frankly, new technology is expensive and you can only go so far. I mean, the distance of Chicago to New York is about 825 miles. If you want to know how fast uh, an order can theoretically be sent through the air at the speed of light, it's about 4.4 milliseconds. So these traders, they're closing in on the theoretical maximum speed at which they can send these orders. All right, so all that brings me to the subject of algorithmic traders and uh, high-frequency traders and their various strategies. High-frequency traders are a form of algorithmic traders. So before I can talk about them, I do have to talk about algorithmic trading. So what is algorithmic trading? Well, it's a method of trading that uses a computer program that follows a defined set of, of instructions. And these algorithmic traders, nowadays, they uh, you could argue they dominate the market or a, a large portion of the market. Uh, essentially, an algorithmic trader, they write a piece of computer code that specifies the price, the volume, uh, the type of order, maybe how long that order is open for, all of these characteristics that uh, would typically go into an order uh, that is submitted, uh, we'll say a buy order or a sell order, uh, all of those are predetermined by the code that's written. And these things run automatically. I mean, in some markets like the foreign exchange market or the US equity market, uh, algorithmic trading is actually the majority of trading. Uh, now, there are a couple of reasons why algorithmic traders exist. The biggest one is that algorithmic trades can be used to break up large orders for a lot of purposes, but the big one is to disguise investor intent. So let's say I am trying to get a toehold investment in, oh, let's say NVIDIA stock. Well, if I'm trying to get a 5% stake in NVIDIA or maybe a 10% stake over the next month, I don't want to go out and just buy several million shares worth of NVIDIA. What I'd rather do is break up my trades over time. So maybe I buy 100 shares in uh, the next minute. Maybe I buy 500 shares five minutes from now. Maybe I send a couple of orders to a couple of dark pools, or maybe I send a couple of orders to the uh, couple of different exchanges, lit exchanges. So algorithmic trading can be used to essentially break up large orders to disguise the intent of investors that want to make big moves. It can also be used 
by high-frequency traders. And high-frequency traders are a type of algorithmic trader that are characterized by the speed of their trades and how quickly they turn over those trades. So they might buy a couple of shares, or let's say a, a round lot of 100 shares, and then sell that same lot of shares within less than a second. That's, the, that's essentially how these high-frequency traders or HFTs work. Uh, their algorithms are written to essentially engage in extremely fast operations. So they need to make sure that their code runs well because in a few seconds, they could lose millions of dollars if that code is not properly written. Now, high-frequency traders, uh, they, if that code isn't properly written, we can see some big movement in the market. So they've been accused of increasing market volatility because if you have a lot of high-frequency traders, with the same code written, or let's say they have similar code where they all want to buy a certain stock if certain market signals are sent, well, then you can have a huge amount of investors buying or being willing to buy that stock at a very, very high price. So you can actually see cases where high-frequency traders can bid up the price of a stock, but you can also see cases where high-frequency traders liquidate massive portions of their holdings. And a good example of this would be the flash crash of 2010. If you want to see a good video on that, on you know, it's very detailed, feel free to click this link. But the flash crash was this event where over the course of really a few minutes, the price of e-mini futures fell off a cliff. Uh, so at about 2.32, the uh, a trader, I forget his actual name, but he, he had written a piece of code and it started uh, a chain reaction where high frequency traders, uh, they saw market movement and they started selling off their shares automatically based on their algorithms. And so we saw this massive sell off of e-mini futures. And just within a few minutes, there was this rebound as investors recognized what was happening and uh, there was this massive buying spree. So within a few minutes, the e-mini futures market saw this massive 9% negative return and rebound, essentially. Uh, so this actually caused a, a huge investigation by the SEC where they determined that the, uh, the trader had been, well, engaging in uh, market manipulation. But uh, the, the big takeaway that a lot of people had from this was that high-frequency traders actually contributed to the, the decline in the price of the e-mini futures and, admittedly, the, the rebound. Now, if you're wondering how prominent high-frequency traders are in the marketplace, uh, it does, I mean, it really does depend on time. So what I have here is a, a graphic from the Financial Times where they break down, really, the entirety of U.S. equity trading. And it, I mean, as you can see here, high-frequency traders make up you know, somewhere I mean, depending on the time period, somewhere between 40 and 50% of the, the market for U.S. equities. Uh, retail investors, these are individual investors, represent somewhere less than 20%. Mutual funds, hedge funds, again, sizable percentages. Quants we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. Uh, but as you can see, high-frequency traders, they make up a huge amount of the volume of shares. So... What tools are these high-frequency traders using? Well, first we have what are called smart routers. And smart routers are, they're essentially tools that allow a high-frequency trader to send a specific order to a specific exchange. So let's say a high-frequency trader wants to send a 100 share buy order for Ford stock for $15 a share to uh, the, the New York Stock Exchange and they want to send a comparable order, or let's say a, a larger order for Apple to, oh, another specific exchange where, uh, you know, wherever that might happen to be. These smart routers, they allow you to essentially identify the, uh, the exchange where you want to send a specific order. Uh, so this is one of the ways that high-frequency traders are able to essentially beat out other traders whose orders are being sent to the same market. Another technique they use, which I mentioned just offhandedly a few minutes ago, is co-location. Well, a lot of high-frequency traders will actually base their servers in the same place as the exchange. 
So for example, in the case of the NASDAQ, they actually advertise the opportunity for investors to co-locate their servers in wherever the NASDAQ is uh, located. It depends on which exchange we're talking about. Uh, so co-location, it allows you to reduce the amount of time it takes for your orders to make it to the NASDAQ's uh, matching system. Uh, so this is really good for high-frequency traders because it reduces the latency. And then there's also a lot of techniques out there or tools like pairs trading, where a high-frequency trader, maybe they identify that two stocks have very similar operations, but one has a, a very different valuation ratio. So uh, high-frequency traders, uh, what they might do is they might take the long position in the undervalued security and the short position on the overvalued security and wait for new information to come in and then profit from that information because they've, they've shorted the stock that's probably overvalued and hopefully should fall in price while the, the undervalued stock should appreciate in price. And so this is actually a, a, a common technique of HFTs called statistical arbitrage. Now, let's talk about what's happened to these traders in the last five years because there has been a lot of movement. Uh, so I've kind of touched on it already, but uh, they are consolidating. I mean, quite frankly, uh, that article that I mentioned, the 2022 article, uh, pretty, said it pretty well. I mean, these there are fewer high-frequency traders. They're consolidating, and they are running up against the laws of physics. I mean, notably, the speed of light. You can only increase the speed of your systems so much before you start to essentially uh, have diminishing returns to scale. Uh, we've also seen some regulatory movements. So, for example, Italy recent, uh, introduced a couple of years ago this uh, two basis point percent tax on equity transactions that last uh, less than five seconds. So this is specifically designed to target the high-frequency traders while not harming any other long-term investors. Uh, so, you know, if you're engaging in too many very rapid transactions, well, you're going to pay a pretty steep steep tax. Uh, and since volume is really what HFTs thrive on, uh, this, this is real damaging to their business model. All right. And finally, uh, I, I think I should point out that the, there is, despite all of these issues that you see here, HFTs continue to profit. And they're profiting from what we typically dub arbitrage trading strategies. So let's talk about a couple of these, or we'll start off with arbitrage and what it is, and then we'll talk about some of the strategies they're using. So what is arbitrage? Arbitrage is an investment strategy in which an investor simultaneously buys and sells assets in different markets to take advantage of a price difference and generate a profit. Now the key here is that they're generating a riskless profit. They are not risking anything. Uh, so they know that if they make these trades, there's no risk of loss. They know exactly how much they stand to gain when they make these trades. Now, these arbitrage opportunities, they quickly get eliminated. I mean, I'll, I'll explain why using the triangular arbitrage example in a few minutes, but essentially, because arbitrage opportunities are so, I mean, it's riskless profit. So, Every trader out there should be willing to engage in arbitrage opportunities. So what this ends up doing is it reduces the, the profits associated with these trades. Uh, so, you know, essentially they get traded out of existence. And these opportunities, they're, although we don't see them as often in equity markets in the U.S. or very, very liquid markets, they tend to be a touch more common in less efficient markets. So, for example, emerging markets or uh, markets with very, very high information asymmetry, so maybe a bond market or some other market like that. So let's talk about a couple of prominent arbitrage trades that high-frequency traders make. First, I suppose I touched on it, but latency arbitrage. And latency arbitrage is really this idea that a uh, high-frequency trader is receiving some new information far away, and they're the first to market. Uh, they're the first to essentially trade on that information. Uh, so the faster you are to get your order in, the more profitable that trade should be. 
And that is very similar to something, another technique that we often dub cross-exchange arbitrage. So for example, uh, you might be able to find a couple of securities that are listed on multiple exchanges. So in cross-exchange arbitrage, you're buying the security at the, the low price on one exchange and you're selling it for the higher price on another exchange. An example of this might be Barrick Gold. So Barrick Gold is actually a company that, is, I think its primary exchange is actually the Toronto Stock Exchange. Well, it lists on both the TSE and the New York Stock Exchange. So you can actually see the price on both exchanges at the same time. And if you determine that, hey, these shares, which should correspond to the same value, are different across these exchanges, you could take a long position in lower valued shares and take a short position in the other ones. And over time, we should see a reversion to a comparable price in those shares. So that's cross-exchange arbitrage. We also have event arbitrage. And event arbitrage involves usually a, a movement in a very predictable way around events. So for example, I mean, there's all kinds of the, these events, but uh, a good example might be merger arbitrage, although that's a little more long-term where uh, target share prices tend to appreciate as soon as it's announced that those targets are being acquired. Another example might be the listing or the addition of a, a stock to an index. So for example, a hedge fund believe, or sorry, a high frequency trader believes that uh, one stock, we'll say it's, oh, let's, we'll say it's Tesla, is about to be added to the S&P 500 index. Well, what they can do is they can go out and buy those shares as soon as that's announced. And the reason they would do that, even after it's announced, is because they expect that other investors that essentially hold a, you know, a portfolio that consists of S&P 500 firms are going to have to buy those shares. So the high-frequency trader is buying up those shares of Tesla in anticipation of those shares price being pushed higher by the demand by other investors. And then finally, we have something called triangular arbitrage. And this is something that exists uh, very frequently in, or I guess it's most frequently in the Forex market, the currency market. Uh, so this is a strategy where you exploit the arbitrage opportunities that exist among three different currencies in the foreign exchange market. So let's take a look at how this works. So I have here three currencies, the US dollar, the British pound, and euros. And triangular arbitrage essentially works by you buying each of these in turn and hoping that in the round trip, the value at the very end will be greater than what you started with. So step one, we'll say we go to uh, counterclockwise. You have US dollars. So you take your US dollars and you buy British pounds. And right now, each dollar buys about 0.82 British pounds. So you go out and buy, oh, we'll say 0.82 British pounds. Let's say you're only doing this with a dollar. Well, your 0.82 pounds, you take them and you buy euros. And let's say each pound buys 1.15 euros. Well, once you have euros, you convert those back into dollars at the current exchange rate. And let's say that's 1.1 euros for every dollar. Uh, or sorry, each euro buys $1.10. So you're essentially making three trades. And in most time periods, we would expect that this triangular arbitrage strategy would not be profitable. But on occasion, we do see that once you've made those trades, your ending value is different than your beginning value. So if your beginning value was a dollar, and you make these trades, you know, convert to 82 or 0.82, uh, 1.15, and then 1.1. Your ending value is a dollar and about, oh, four cents. And so your total profit here is that difference. It's the price you end with minus the price you started at. So this right here, this 0 0.0373, that's your arbitrage uh, profit. So the goal here, if you're a high frequency trader is to make this many, many times. 
Now, the problem is if uh, eventually, as you make these trades, you're going to bid up the price of the pound and uh, over time, uh, so the you know it gets more expensive to buy pounds. And so over time, this exchange rate will actually fall. You know, dollar falls relative to the pound. And so over time, this profit should go closer and closer to zero. Essentially, by making this trade frequently, you're increasing the efficiency of the market. All right, so finally, let's talk about how regulations have changed. Uh, so there have been a large number of changes with respect to high-frequency traders and uh, some of their strategies, but there really haven't been enough. I mean, there are really two pieces of regulation that I want to talk about. Uh, the first occurred in 2017 when the SEC uh, required anyone who's writing algorithms or algorithmic trading strategies, it required them to pass the Series 57 exam and register as a securities trader. And the Series 57 exam is this exam where you essentially show that you are qualified to be a, a trader of a, a, well, a securities house. It essentially tests your knowledge about, you know, securities, how they're transacted, uh, how equities are are traded, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it's, you know, before you can take this, you also have to take your, your SIE exam which is really the, the basic exam for anyone who wants to trade securities. The other piece of regulation that several regulators tried to roll out was this thing called Reg AT. And Reg AT, it had a lot of uh, pieces to it, but the biggest part is this bullet point down here. Uh, it was the most impactful for high-frequency traders in that it would require high-frequency traders and other algorithmic traders to provide a copy of their source code essentially the code they use to trade on the markets. Now, uh, this had been kicked around for a couple of years until June of 2020 when the uh, commissioner of the CFTC actually canceled it. Uh, it they took a vote and uh, it, it didn't pass the vote. And so, you know, it, it was a very close thing. So uh, on June 25th, 2020, uh, the five commissioners of the CFTC voted three to two uh, to withdraw Reg AT, so uh, now they don't. Uh, high frequency traders do not have to provide their their source code. All right, so let's summarize. Uh, first things first, speed can be very profitable for investors, particularly high frequency traders, because that's their business model. Essentially, trade very quickly and in high volume. Uh, the downside is that they are seeing. Uh, diminishing marginal returns. We've also saw that arbitrage opportunities exist for only a brief amount of time. Uh, this is because a lot of these arbitrage opportunities, they get traded on when they're discovered, and then very quickly the, the profit that you can earn on them diminishes as a result. And finally, these high-frequency tra traders, they engage in a variety of strategies to profit on quick movements. I mean, Essentially, they have the technology and they're using it to find new ways to essentially profit from market behavior. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. And if you have any questions, obviously, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I suppose I'll see you in the next video.